Greta, thanks for joining us today on the show. Thanks for having me. You have 16 million Instagram followers. How did you even start that? Well, I started at zero, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was back in 2012. Uh, Instagram wasn't as widely used, obviously, as it was now. Um, so back in 2012, I started my first Instagram account, which was a personal account. And then I created an Instagram account for my first brand, Skinny Me Tea. Uh, at the time, Instagram didn't have any features for businesses. So taking a business account was just uh, as simple as changing the account name to Skinny Me Tea. Right. Uh, yeah. But we started to grow that account quite quickly. And so by the end of 2012, we had around 200,000 followers on Instagram, which was the biggest brand on Instagram at the time. I think oh, Nike wow. had about 10,000 followers wow. at the end of 2012. So okay. we kind of... I guess to an extent kind of pioneered that Instagram presence for uh, some brands and that's where I started growing my following from. So Skinny Me Tea, was, was that your business at the time or did it come after setting up the Instagram account? When I started Skinny Me Tea, I was 22 years old at the time. I had $24 in the bank Love and it. this was back in 2012 yeah. and I was working full-time at a media agency in the city. I'd only been there for a couple of months. I'd just graduated my media and communications degree the year before and I was mixing different tea blends around the office and just wanted to try a different type of detox. I'd done a lot of the different detoxes available at The Chemist. A girlfriend and I had just kind of tried and tr trialed and tried a lot of the different detoxes. And I just wanted a much more natural approach. I just felt funny detoxing when there were actual toxins in what you were detoxing with, for yeah. one. Mm. I wanted an all natural, uh, organic uh, product. And also I wanted to know exactly what was going into the product. When there's a tablet, it's far less transparent. So I started mixing my own blends of tea and my colleagues started trying them and then my friends started trying them and then their friends started trying them and everybody was messaging me to try this tea, which I'd called a tea tox, so a detox of tea. So what, were you, what were you putting into it? How did you know I'd to put into it? All different things. So okay. I did some research. Yeah. Uh, once I decided that it was going to become less of a hobby and maybe more of a business, uh, which came off the back of getting all these messages, I just didn't know how to respond to everybody so I was like there's got to be an easier way to do this so I googled how to create an online store I didn't even know what the word e-commerce was at the time Brilliant. so I jumped on google created that uh found Shopify and set my store up within about a day uh probably about, took me about eight hours in total but for the ingredients themselves I still had a Melbourne Uni pass so I went to the library and I started researching different ingredients and so rather than researching okay what does green tea do your, to your body or what does yerba mate do to your body yeah. I would more read studies on what we wanted the effects to be so it was a much more effects based approach so it was more like how do you increase your metabolism with herbs how do you you know suppress appetite with herbs you know what combination of herbs delays appetite suppression suppression which is like gastric emptying it's all very okay it's technical a bit gross so but <laughs> so how long then before when you started mixing the teas in the office to saying I'm leaving my job I'm leaving this and I'm moving on to skinny tea I was probably still at my job for around the first month of the business okay which was really how we started out with yeah well it was quite quick yeah um, I thought that that was really long uh but when I first started out, I was taking pre-orders only and that had a lot to do with the fact that I was still working full time. So I would take orders during the week for the five days during the week and then I'd yep. fulfill them on the weekends because that's when I had time to fulfill them. I didn't know that that was called a pre-sale or pre-orders. It was just I knew that I needed the money to be able to go and buy all of the raw ingredients and then mix them and I was mixing the tea by hand, sending them out in packages, in the mail, just in an envelope as well. So you were making it up as you went along. Like yeah. you were just going. And so what were some of the big learning? You grew really fast. So we what did. were some of the big learning curves in that year? Yeah, so we grew from zero, again, obviously, yeah. to around $600,000 a month within six months wow. of starting the business. And nice. when we grew to that level, we still didn't have a proper manufacturer. There were no manufacturers in Australia that could fulfill that level of uh 
uh, like tea orders. Um, and I would literally think to myself, I'd be like, how do Lipton do it? How do they put all that, <laughs> you know, they've got so much tea and how do they put it in all of those tea bags? And there's got to be a way to do this, obviously. Yeah. I had absolutely no idea really what I was doing. It was just kind of problem solving on my feet. So I thought tea, China, let's give that a shot. <laughs> And that didn't work out so well. I, I know I heard before that you there was some disaster. There was a disaster. Tell me about Tell us about this. So we went over to China and originally the initial orders that we placed with our manufacturer were great. We were getting them back. We were sending them back to Australia. We were getting them quality assured in Australia as well as in China because we didn't necessarily know whether to trust their internal quality assurance. So it was all great. And then we placed a really large order of tea, which was the first mistake. I just thought, okay, we're always running in and out of stock. Imagine how much faster we could grow and how much more money we could make and how great it would be if I just had a year's worth of tea. And so I placed an order for a year's worth of tea, which was over a million US dollars worth of tea at the time. I think wow. it was actually around 1.3 million US dollars, but the US and Australian dollar were pretty on par at the time. So at this point, you'd already built up that sort of capital. You had that much money oh, yeah. ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Because we were Fantastic. doing the 600K a month. And you're 22. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Um, so we were growing very quickly and yeah. I was like, okay, so I'm going to go work out how to get all of this tea at once. And we received the order finally. We held it in a warehouse in Hong Kong for a while. That cost money. We shipped it to Australia. That cost more money. Got held in customs for a week. That was another $80,000. Then we finally opened up the tea. Super excited to start shipping it out. We'd just run out of our uh, Australian manufacturer's product and the tea was compost, basically. It was disgusting. I wouldn't even let my team touch it without gloves on. It had metal bolts in it, oh had springs in it. You could just see it was wet and dirty and disgusting and we sent it off to be tested just, you know, for a laugh. And it had E. coli and all kinds of bacteria in disaster. it. It disaster. was an absolute disaster. So how did you recover from that? $1.3 million. At first I you know, handled it in the way that everybody would. Cry. I freaked out a little. I <laughs> cried a bit. Uh, I remember my general manager and I were in a car and we were behind a truck that had building supplies on it and some wood was very precariously placed and we were like, do your worst wood. Oh. We're done. <laughs> we don't care. Fall off the truck. Get That's us. But, like, <laughs> it's the end. Come at us. Um, but I called a friend of mine in Hong Kong and he's a lawyer and he's uh, like a litigator in Hong Kong and he's very high up and I was like, okay, Andrew, what chance do I have of uh, being able to, you know, sue our supplier to be able to get a refund or get new product that isn't disgusting? Uh, and he was like, basically little to no chance. So I knew as of then that I just had to kind of cut my losses and get over it very, very quickly. And that did become kind of one of my biggest learnings was to fail fast. Like resilience is how quickly you can get over your failures, basically. And that is what you need when you're starting something out and you're Absolutely. constantly problem solving there's constant problems all over the place you're constantly putting out fires because at that point i think a lot of people were just thrown the thrown the towel in and said right 1.3 million gone i'm, I'm out of here i'm done like did you have somebody advising you or do you have mentors or did you have i guess the first part was we were fortunate that we'd paid for that up front We'd paid, not in cash, physical cash, which you actually probably could in China, uh, but we'd paid for it up front. We didn't have a $1.3 million debt. So okay. that was one positive. But uh, I had people that I could slightly lean on, but no, I didn't really have mentors when I was first starting out per se. The first time that I had any form of mentorship was about a year after we started, we won the Shopify Build a Business competition, and Fantastic. which was really great. Yeah. They flew us to New York. We got to meet incredible business mentors. I had no idea who they were at the time. It was like Tim Ferriss, uh, wow. Eric Rees, who wrote The Lean Startup, like the editor-in-chief of Fast Companies publication, just incredible Brilliant. people. Uh, I remember just reading up, I read Tim Ferriss's uh, four-hour work week on the plane on the way over and was like, okay, I kind of get what this guy's on about. And The Lean Startup, I was like, oh, I'm already doing that. That's fine. I read the blurb and was like, I don't need this book. I'm doing that. 
Um, so no, I didn't really have mentors per se. I think it was a lot more about mindset. So yeah. it was kind of just admitting that you'd made a mistake without an ego and letting that get in the way and just not blaming anybody else, just saying this has happened and, and then, then moving mm-hmm. on as quickly as possible and just focusing on the positives again. Yeah. Well, you just landed like, so you'd essentially just landed on what you, what is now like sort of like your template of like successful e-commerce and so now you kind of, then you copied and pasted that more or less into a number of different businesses. Yeah, to an extent. So like, can you just describe how that sort of framework, how I think it works? Like, how I came about that understanding was I had just this huge fear. We were such an overnight success. I just yeah. figured that everything would end as quickly as it began, basically. I thought that, you know, everything was going to be gone the next day. Every night when I went to bed, I'd be like, okay, cool, good run, but it's all over tomorrow. Enjoy yeah. this. Well, it could have well, with, ha- exactly. with China, it, yeah, it could have completely. happened. Yeah, completely. Um, and so it took until a friend of mine in Hong Kong who was pretty interesting in business. He's the head of a large turnaround company. Uh, and he said, Greta, okay, today is Thursday. If everything went under tomorrow on Friday, what would you be doing on Monday? And I was like, starting again. And so I've realized that everything that I'd been learning was applicable to everything that I would be doing. Yeah. And that those skills and that mindset, I could kind of continue on with. So that's what I did. I did repeat it uh, multiple times. So now I have four different e-commerce companies uh, or have been involved in. So my second company I started, which I've now exited, is called The Fifth Watches. And our point of difference was that we only sold our watches on the fifth of each month for five days. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit how you got that started. So you went from skinny teeth to watches. Where did you come up with that idea? Yeah, well, my co-founder was a lot more interested in the watch space and I was uh, just interested in, I guess, the marketing side of that. Uh, I knew that watches were increasingly popular. A lot of direct-to-consumer brands were springing up online Mm. like Daniel Wellington, MBMT Watches uh, and a lot of different brands in that space. I just thought that it was a really interesting interplay between, I guess, like consumer psychology and your product. So by being only available for five days, it meant that we could increase demand through scarcity and it meant that we could increase perceived value of our product through exclusivity. So, so that was you could the only buy them online for on the fifth of five each month for so five days. It's scarcity marketing, exactly. And I mean so that came about because we sold out of all of our products on our first day. Okay. So we did. Uh, we sold over a thousand watches on our first day, which was over a hundred thousand dollars in sales. So that company actually grew faster than Skinny Me Tea, even which I didn't think was possible at that time. Uh, on our first birthday, in the end, we did uh, over a million Australian dollars in sales in a single day on the 5th wow. of December in yeah. 2015. So th- it was just the way that that kind of came about was through uh, a need from our brand. Yeah. So we had 8,000 people signed up who really, really wanted our watches and we only had 1,200 watches to sell. And so rather than, I guess, uh, saying, okay, sorry, we sold out of everything, we said, okay, well, actually, it was kind of turning a negative, so selling out into a positive. And that's sure, what I had to sure. just kind of learn to do constantly with Skinny Me Tea. It was just about managing expectations through your communications. So, so successful skinny me, successful fifth watches. So what's, what was the secret? What's the secret to the success? I think by the time it got to the fifth, I understood where a lot of our wins came from with Skinny Me Tea. And the main thing that I recommend all the time and the main kind of framework that I rely upon is this concept of market product fit. So as opposed to the concept of product market fit, where you have a product and you try to find an audience and a consumer to buy that product. It's kind of taking the reverse approach. Just swinging it around. Exactly. So, okay, so you you said, okay, I want to start selling watches. How do you build up an audience for watches? Well, so you built the audience first and then you dropped in the watch. Yeah. So I had a few different audiences. So my 16 million followers on Instagram are across a few different accounts in different niches. Okay. So the reason that I grew those up was uh, to create, I guess, a bit of a brand awareness funnel. So when I post on one account, it's relevant to, you know, one audience set, which might be the detox or health market. 
uh, and other accounts were more fashion based and things like that. So okay. we started to build awareness around the watches in a few ways. We did uh, some giveaways with uh, products that were quite similar in the space, but we also used a lot of influencer marketing, which has been a cornerstone of the growth of a lot of my businesses. Back then, if you were the biggest on Instagram, influencers weren't even a thing back no. then. So you just send them a product and get them to... who? Like, How did you even identify who an influencer was? I first discovered... I felt like I first discovered influencer marketing because I first <laughs> discovered it for myself at least because I wasn't reading any of the business publications or anything but was, I guess... You were just uh, making it up. Exactly. And I, I made it up as I went along. I was like, okay, this works. Focus on that. Keep focusing on that until it doesn't work anymore. Excellent, we excellent. find something else that yeah, works yeah. and keep focusing on that. So... Uh, a girl from Tasmania bought our tea and she had around a thousand followers at the time. This was back in 2012 and that was what constituted an influencer at the time. Not that I thought that. So she bought the product, she posted to Instagram and we had our biggest day of sales ever. So I was like, okay, well, every time I'm on Instagram now and I see a girl that fits her persona, yeah. uh, because like we were chatting about earlier um, – before we started chatting here, yeah. uh, influencer marketing is very much about finding your influencer persona or your avatar and working backward from there once you know what works. So we knew what worked because we just had our biggest day of sales from this girl in Tasmania. And so every time I saw a girl that fit her profile, I would screenshot Yuck. them. Yeah, exactly. I'd <laughs> go back. There wasn't even direct messages on Insta at the time. Right. I had to just comment on their photo being like, hi, lovely. Do you have an email address that I could, you know, flick through a little, uh, not even proposal to? I'd just be like, hi, um, would you be okay if I sent you some tea if you did a review of the tea? And I would always ask for honest reviews. And they would? Yeah, and 95% of the time, the girls were just super flattered uh, that Amazing. we wanted to send them free product. They were like, yes, okay, sure. Nice. And that is very much not how it necessarily works anymore. You'd have to pay them. It's a lot of them pay to play. So say somebody has a million followers, would you have to pay them? How much? Yes. Okay. Uh, probably ten to $20,000 per post. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, the equivalent of a million I followers at the time was probably 50 or 100,000 followers. Nice. So... And even at the time, all of those people were still willing to do product for post. So I do want to actually talk to you about how to become an influencer and how to um, about influence. But we do have um, some questions from the audience that I want to get to. Um, the first one was, yeah, which platform? So you spoke about Instagram. Is that the pl which is that the platform that helped you grow most? Instagram's definitely the platform that helped us grow most. And is that the way it's going to be in the future? Right now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for organic growth, I still think that Instagram is the most powerful platform. For paid growth, uh, we see better conversions on something like Facebook or YouTube. YouTube is an extremely powerful platform as well. Mm -hmm. um, Instagram is great for brands in that you can, you know, create both static still imagery and videos, but YouTube and YouTube influencers and brands that are able to capture an audience's attention on YouTube are extremely powerful because it is just, it's a very easy way to build trust with your audience very quickly because at the end of the day, people will remember, there's a quote about this, that people will remember they won't remember what you said, they'll remember how you made them feel. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. Um, so with, like, say, YouTube or across Instagram, what's the most you've ever paid for a post? $20,000 wow. for a post, which isn't actually Can you tell me all who, who that, that was? much. Uh, her name is... Oh, I don't want to mispronounce it, but Negan Mirashali. Uh, she's a huge influencer now. She has her own hair care range now as well. Um, and, I mean, but some brands pay up to $500,000 a post to be featured on, you know, the Kardashians, Instagram feeds and Absolutely. things like that. So how the many more celebrity style influencers, but I've never personally paid that myself. I've worked with brands who have. Okay. And for that one, that $20,000 one, how many followers did she have, for example? She had 20,000. She would have had close to a million at that stage. And did it work? Was it successful for you? It was successful, yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it was successful, but at the same time, if we'd probably paid 20 influencers $1,000, it probably would have been even more successful because okay. I guess the micro-influencer audience uh, – uh, that much more engaged micro influencers are a lot more authentic and the power of influencers are uh, their ability to be able to form uh, 
fast and strong relationships with their audience uh, and not only to have their audience's attention but also to have their trust. Yeah. So that micro-influencer audience often has a much higher trust rate because um, relationship, the relationship between an influencer and their audience is the most powerful thing. Yeah, because it, it, that is true like with celebrities who get paid to do a post but then they are conflicted, they can be conflicted. Yeah, I think that macro influencers just need to be extremely discerning with who they choose to partner with. They need to realise that that is extremely representative, not only of the brand that they're working with, but of their own personal brand as well. Yeah, so absolutely. they need to make sure that those partnerships really suit uh, who they are and who their audience are as well. For sure. I have another question. Um, right. So in the early days, because we know that you lost 1.3 million at the beginning, like in after the first year, was the funding in the early years all bootstrapped purely from revenue? Yeah, all of my e-commerce brands have all been bootstrapped. Uh, the only investment that I've had has been for my new tech venture, which is called Hey Influencers, which is an influencer marketing platform. Okay. So we got uh, investment from two investors, so Blackbird Ventures here in Sydney led yep. the round, okay. uh, who are incredible. They've invested in companies like Canva and Atlassian, uh, and then Amalfi Capital participated in the round as well, who was Paul, who's one of my mentors now. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, who has been the biggest influence on you? <sighs> it is always a hard one. Um, honestly, I don't follow personal influences, uh, like business influences that closely. I don't have just like one specific one that I'm like, oh, I love Oprah, I do. but <laughs> Or I love Richard Branson, I do, of <laughs> course. But yeah. I think the, the people that are always going to influence me most are our customers and it's our audience and yeah. it's just kind of being able to crowdsource demand for our products off the back of that, yeah. uh, take constant inspiration and motivation. Reading our customer reviews is something I really, really love. Uh, we still put together, you know, a little roundup of our favourite ones from the week and read through those. So yeah. that's always a really motivational thing for me. Absolutely. So I know a lot of people here, like you have 16 million people. A lot of people have, I've got, a, I don't, I don't even how many know how many followers I have on Instagram. A lot of people want to know, okay, I'm, I have 500 followers. How do I get to 500,000? What are some of your growth hacks? Quick tips. Yeah. Well, the three things that I focus on most in community building are what I call the three C's. So they're the kind of three pillars that everything else is based off and formed around. So okay. the first C would be content. The second C would be collaboration. And the third C is consistency. So from a content perspective, it's creating content and posting content that your audience actually wants to see. So identifying your TPP, which are your top performing posts, and posting more of that content, recreating content that is already done well with your audience. So that's one little trick from the content side. So would you be, were you talking about like leveraging viral content there or actually creating your own original content? You can definitely leverage viral content as well, okay. or you can create your own original content. You can use inspiration from the viral content for that. We do uh, on my niche account pages or vertical account pages or fan pages, yep. whatever you'd like to call them, not on our brand pages as much. We use a lot of viral content on our brand pages. We might use meme content, just things that are relatable to our audience that are doing well. So like the tweet repost as the Instagram picture right now performs really, really well across the board. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that's one example of, but to identify viral content, I guess within your niche, you would go onto a page you would see uh, their average engagement rate, which might be 2,000 likes per photo, and then you see one photo got 8,000 likes. The thing is that's, that's not – exactly, that's the viral content that you want to take and repurpose for your account because not only did their audience identify with that content, there's also something within the Instagram algorithm uh, that works around image recognition. So the algorithm can identify when content is viral and when it is trending, and if you do repost that content, content it's actually going to algorithmically perform a lot better than other content too because the algorithm identifies okay that already did well in this niche on this account we're going to boost the organic reach automatically of that content so that is another reason why 
that works really well. So figuring out the algorithms. <laughs> I don't know if anybody can figure out the algorithms of Facebook and um, Instagram. But I don't think that... Uh, I know it's. this is a question that I get a lot yeah. as well, but the algorithms are very similar. Like social media is called social media for a reason. They are always going to... Uh, all of the social media platforms are always going to prioritise engagement. Yeah. Uh, and post stay time, for example, because they're businesses. They want as many users on their platform for as long as possible, engaging with as much content as possible. That's where their value lies. Yeah. So if you can reverse engineer your content for engagement, uh, create different call to actions, uh, post like you know things that are going to evoke certain emotions, that's always going to be so much more powerful. So engagement is the number one factor. So engagement that is key. Will determine how the algorithm sorts your content and how much reach it assigns organically to that content. How do you deal with influencers with like say fake followers? How do you identify people who've got a bunch of fake followers? The thing is with fake followers, there can also be fake engagement even. Oh, so really? yeah, I think that it's usually um, in terms of comments that are fake are things like love it. That's so cool. You know, like, like a love heart and things. Them. Yeah. If people are asking them actual questions saying, like, where did you get that top? Like, how do I know, you know, what time of day I should feed my baby this specific food? Things yeah. like that, depending on their niche, obviously. Um, the commenting and that kind of two-way interaction between the influencer and their, and their audience is a really good way to be able to see that. Uh, and then also, of course, asking for further insights from the influencers. So, you know, the behind the scenes insights that they are able to kind of screenshot and send across to you. So it must take a huge, like a huge amount of time. I know, like, for example, like even we're at the moment building up some Facebook groups and that kind of thing. But the amount of time it takes, like the journalists to go through the groups and you, it must take so much time. How do you balance that time on screen versus time off screen? Well, I have an amazing team. It's okay, not, of course. of course, just me. Yes. Um, so it's a lot of it's to do with, yeah, community management, like you're saying. Um, and it is a balance, of course. Uh, it's always deciding, you know, as a founder, what roles you're best to serve within your company and whether, yeah. you know, that is more so deciding on, you know, the overall style or aesthetic of the account and the theme or whether it's finding the content specifically or whether it's engaging back with followers there's probably you know certain parts where you would draw the line yeah people without a team though say who are just on their own they haven't got to where you are like how did and, and you at the beginning how did you sort of digitally detox or did oh, you no i didn't <laughs> I, it took me a while to kind of realize that i needed to it took me until i was in hong kong and i lost my phone and i was over there with my general manager now she was my like sort of PA, I just didn't know what to call her at the time, just my right-hand girl. Uh, and I lost my phone and she let me just hold her phone because I just felt like I needed the weight of the phone in my hand for me to realise I've got a problem. I'm addicted well, to my yeah. phone. So I think a lot of people are, though. A lot of people are. You feel almost like you... It's almost like withdrawal. I sometimes. know. A phone is like an extension to yourself a lot of the time. You often have it in your hand. Do you think it's a problem? Do you think it's going to be a problem yeah. generally for people? Yeah, it's a huge problem. I just read this article recently which was basically centred around the fact that uh, we're going to look back on our mobile phones the same way as 50 years ago we looked back on cigarettes. Yeah. So it's a, it is a real problem and with that level of connectivity people need to like find out actionable ways to disconnect whether it's you know setting rules for yourself like I do not touch my phone after 10 p.m at night. Yeah. Uh, there's certain apps and things that you can use to lock you out of certain uh, apps if you've spent too much time on them for example. Yeah. So it's just about that and it's about disconnecting in the way that you want to do like you know pursuing your passions and you know putting your phone to the side just turning it off yeah easier said than done of course <laughs> um so over the course of the last you know few years what have been some of the major learnings and for you i think i mean obviously the example that happened with the tea yeah. um that was uh, a big learning for me um, and again the learning that came out of that was to fail fast. Yeah. I think that is still probably like my central learning around that. Uh, other things that I think about often are the um, 
you know, done is better than perfect, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. I think a so lot true. of people strive for perfection in what they're putting out and especially with content for social, et cetera, just getting it up there and realising, you know, you can always take it back down. You can always edit certain elements, like just sense. get it out there. I think that's a big hindrance for people trying to get things done. They try to make it perfect, exactly. Exactly. So one of my favourite quotes um, is from Reid Hoffman and it's – about launching a brand and a product and it's if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product you've launched too late and yeah. my first version of skinny me tea was not great. extremely embarrassing we're gonna have to try some this is water it's not skinny me <laughs> <tea> today <laughs> um and so with the when you just mentioned books there you mentioned um that author that she said is like is one of the, the quotes that you really like what's any books or any tools that you really think it will be amazing for people who are so social, social media. The books changed my mindset around marketing the most probably uh, much more and helped shift my mindset more to the kind of consumer psychology was uh, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Cialdini. Cialdini. Yes, yes. Which I love. I actually, I read a Shopify article that had condensed that into a few different paragraphs and then I went back, read the book and I've now listened to it as an audio book as well I often go back into that and you know it's around principles like scarcity which I don't think I would have come up with that solution for the fifth exactly I wouldn't have been like okay you know we've got too many people not enough watches what do we do around it I wouldn't have thought tactic exactly so like scarcity reciprocity so you know the give take um every time that you uh ask your audience something to make sure that you're giving them something back in return. So things like a lot of how we convert our Instagram followers into our email subscribers are through incentives. So that incentive might be a discount code or free shipping or it might be a free resource or a free challenge around something or, you know, it's all sorts of different things uh, but it's incentivizing audiences to perform certain actions for you on your behalf. So reciprocity. I think if you read through... Uh, the, the main sections in that uh, book, you're able to kind of think of the things that you would apply back. It was just extremely actionable for me and it changed my entire thinking and Amazing. mindset around how I saw audience. It's great to have a book like that that you just keep going back to. Like it's, I think another one would be how to win friends and influence people. Exactly. Daily yeah, and then there's, oh, there's so many. There's the brain that changes itself. That's a really interesting one. I think that's around neuroplasticity. Uh, okay. So, yeah, there's, <laughs> wow. I mean, there's it's, lots. it's interesting. Um, there's a couple more questions um, from the audience. What's your morning ritual? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I hate this question because I'm not, I don't have a morning ritual. I'm not really even a morning person. I would rarely wake up far before 7.30 probably. Uh, the, part of the reason that I love doing what I do is that every day is different. I didn't like I didn't sign up to do a nine to five to sit down at my desk at 9 a.m., leave the office at that time and know what I'm doing between nine to ten is emails, ten to eleven is a meeting, this is this. Yeah. Like I love I kind of people always say like, oh, how do you balance having like lots of different companies in lots of different areas? I kind of think of it like when you're in high school and you went from maths into English, it was like a whole new part of your brain. Like every day I'm just accessing different parts of my mind and that's how you stay kind of creative and that's how you can innovate because a lot of the times I'll find something that works really well with, you know, Skinny Me Tea and then I'll apply it to my other brand, Drop Bottle, for example. I know we mentioned other platforms. I know Instagram has been your main one. Um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn I love. So you do? Pinterest I love. I, there are a lot of platforms that okay. I use outside. LinkedIn is really, really powerful. So I did uh, this short course at Stanford University a while ago, uh, which was taken by Reid Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn, who I quoted before. Uh, it was called Technology Enabled Blitz Scaling. Happy I could say that. Um, and he spoke about you know his plans for LinkedIn at that time. And I was just keeping an eye on the company. I could see that they were hiring a lot of ex-Facebook developers. So I had the feeling that, you know, their feed and their content was going to become a lot and a lot more generic uh, and a lot more like the Facebook feed. So I understood certain things that would affect that 
in terms of the algorithm itself as well. So reverse engineering a post for engagement again. So literally, I sometimes I do this specific type of post where I crowdsource the demand for content I haven't even created yet. I'm like, who would be interested in an influencer marketing cheat sheet if I was to create one? And if I get like a thousand comments on that post, then I'll create one. Fantastic. So Fantastic. it's yeah. kind of just a way to be able to like create the content that your audience wants, uh, not spend time creating content that they don't really want. Sometimes I post something and there's like 10 comments. I'm like, okay, sorry yeah. guys, it's not going <laughs> to happen. It. Not <laughs> um, so your strategy, how has it really evolved then over time? My social strategy or yeah. business? Or your bi overall business strategy. Yeah, well, I think that it has just been through a lot of applied learning. So it's been realising the things that have worked, realising the things that haven't and turning those into a bit of a framework per se. So now I have, you know, an entire, I guess, template almost for when I do want to start a new e-commerce brand. Uh, and I have actually worked closely with a publication called Founder Magazine to turn that into a course, uh, which is called Start and Scale. So that takes you all the way from starting, so ideation through to coming up with um, a product, uh, sorry, from ideation to coming up with a product idea, branding your idea, manufacturing, um, then launching and scaling ultimately. So they're the kind of main modules of the course uh, and we go into a lot of detail around each. One of the really important things that I just return to again and again when coming up with a product idea is how to innovate, how to create a product that and is different to. and how yeah. to position your product as different. Yeah. Um, and I look at a lot of different factors when I'm doing that and there's kind of a bit of an innovation framework in that way. I suppose, what's, so what's the plan? What's the future look like? What's next on the cards for Greta? I think I need to stop thinking what's next at the same time and just focusing on the things that already are. There is a lot going on uh, and you can innovate a lot within your own company at the same time. So uh, we always have team meetings for Hay and we come up with, uh, so for my influencer marketing platform, and we come up with three new different, whole entirely different concepts for the same product. Um, and we need to just focus on uh, have a little, having a little bit more tunnel vision, I guess. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily, I mean, this you year though. Ideas, ideas, ideas. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, this year I am um, about to finalise my first investment in a company that isn't one of my own, okay. which is interesting. So I'm co-investing in a round with Blackbird now who were our, inve well, are our investors in Hay. Who are you investing in? Uh, they're a group called, they're called Eucalyptus and it's basically a, it's a little bit structured like an agency that helps incubate e-commerce brands. Just the only thing is the direct-to-consumer brands they're creating are all their own. So okay. it's kind of creating a house of brands, I guess a little bit like without, you know, the years and years that went into them, a bit like a Procter & Gamble or a Unilever of modern uh, direct-to-consumer brands. Okay. So it's definitely something I'm interested in. And the last question, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs wanting to get an e-commerce business off the ground? I think that, again, it would all be about that market product fit. It would be about building an audience before you launch your product. Yeah. I think in the past, the great kind of e-commerce myth has been build it and they will come. So like create a product, put it online, create some beautiful imagery, press live on the store and just wait for the what? sales to start <laughs> flooding in. It doesn't happen. Not in that way, no. Yeah. So if you, I guess if you are building an audience before you launch a product, uh, you're kind of mitigating that risk of launching to crickets. Fantastic. Greta, that's been so interesting. Thank you so much for coming on the show Thanks and for I look forward me. to seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, guys. Cool.